There we go, Anchor It. We are ready to go. I introduced you as being the, one of the co-founders of Mira and about all the great creative things you do. And now, well, we'll start with the bird. Well, this is the, this is the adventure going through my art exhibitions. I thought I would start off just by perhaps explaining how I got into the world of art. And it was all rather un, unplanned and unexpected. But way back in 1962, we invested as a family in a Samoyed puppy dog. Now this dear little puppy was, I think about six months old, a really rampageous little puppy. I had four young children and I was, I think, great age of 30. So as my Samoyed grew up, I started to gather all his wool, beautiful furry undercoat, and I knew that I'd be able to spin. Well, I had to look for a spinner and the Oakville weavers and spinners had just started to spin and started spinning lessons. So off I went to the weavers and spinners with my lovely big bag of fleece, or at least dog hair, and I learned to spin. But while I was there, I saw them weaving. And of course, a lot of their program were off loom weaving techniques that I could do, but um, I was still very tempted to learn to weave. But just at that time, which was about 1971 or so, I discovered that Sheridan College had opened a, a campus in Mississauga for, for the crafts and design. And there was the most wonderful weaving program. So I, I bravely went and had a look and I discovered I could sign up for three years and, and learn how to weave. But of course, along the way, I was going to learn how to throw pots, net, solder a silver necklace and blow a glass bowl and make a chair and it was all very exciting and I just had three years of the most wonderful wonderful art education. Um, it was at the time when the hippies were all, I started I think in 1972, the ripe age of 40 and we did the most amazing things but one of the things we learned most of all was we did nothing original, everything had to be made um, conceptually or designed originally, and certainly nothing following a pattern. So it was a real eye-opener. At the end of three years, I graduated with an idea of becoming a weaver and weaving blankets on a six-foot loom. But on the way through the program, we had to do a three-dimensional fiber piece, uh, a sculpture. And I remembered that I, as a child, had actually made a baskets as a waste paper basket and a few things. So I went out and gathered in my very conceptual way, gathered Weeping Willow and made the most amazing basket and took it off as my sculptural piece. Well, everybody was blown away. Nobody thought that anybody was making baskets. And of course, um, I then rediscovered basketry and I discovered that it was really my thing because I love to go out into the wilderness and collect things. It was sculptural, it was natural, and it had tremendous potential. So along with my loom and my weaving, I was playing along with doing, making funny shapes. I also lived by the lake at that time. And I used to walk along the lake with my dogs every morning and collect all sorts of bits of, um, oh, sculptures, driftwood, little treasures that came up. And if we look at the next page, I think you'll see a piece um, a, a sort of bird shape with the lake behind it. And I was making birds and things with macrame, with weaving, but with basketry materials. And this is really the start of my career. I didn't know I was going to do this. It was all an adventure. And I discovered that basketry was extremely unknown in Canada. And it was very, very hard to find anybody who was making baskets except at the CNIB. And there were horrible things just horrible things made out of round reed. Anyway, on I went with my pursuit. And at the same time, I, I joined um, a gallery in Oakville called the Little Gallery. And I think there were about 10 of us. I was the only textile person. And I joined really because of my weaving, but I did produce my baskets. And I decided that I would have a one man show and I would show my baskets and my birds. So I think if we look at the next page, you'll see a whole lot of funny looking birds and things. 
And these were the things that I was making using the driftwood and the things I found, the objects that I found on the beach and making all sorts of weird and wonderful things. At the same time, I had this big six foot loom. And on the next page, if we look, you will see I wove big six foot blankets using the inspiration of the color of the lake. And I suppose my training at sort of design had been everything had to be inspired, had to have a meaning. We didn't just weave anything, which was wonderful, except, of course, you couldn't really be a routine craftsperson. Everything had to be new and grand. And I wove six blankets, of which I think you could probably see three on the page. And you can see I took a color photograph so that you could see where the design came from. I dyed a lot of the material and I did quite a lot of spinning for the blankets. So my exhibition had six blankets and quite a lot of funny looking birds. And during this exhibition, the minister from my church came and invited me to do a series of banners for Christ Church Cathedral in Hamilton. And I think if we look at the next page, I hope you're on the next page, we'll see a funny little cottage and all sorts of things lying on the stones. I went up for a month, rented a cottage. I took my six foot loom with me. My dear sweet John helped me carry it down the pass and into the cottage. We assembled it and I stayed there for a month and I wove six banners for the cathedral. And I took, I wove them all on one warp. You can see them there all laid out on the stones and you can see them at the bottom of the page. They were displayed in the cathedral. But on the next page, please, Helen, you will see the banners and they were six feet long. I wove them across the loom and they represented the various church festivals, starting with Advent at the top on the left. Then we had the three kings. Then we had Lent. And then coming down to the bottom, we had PX, which is the sign for Easter. And then we had the loosening of the tongues, Pentecost. And then we had Trinity. And those were the six banners that I made for the um, for the cathedral. And that was that was fun. I loved working on my loom. And I had a special technique, a sort of weft technique, which I had come up with, which I could use as a sort of tapestry effect. Well, on we, on we went. But at the same time, you may remember, but we were very anxious to have crafts ad sort of admitted to the big galleries as art and not craft. And there was a big movement then because textiles were looked at as sort of cottage crafts and things that people mm -hmm. did rather mm -hmm. traditionally. And I got together with six other contemporary fiber people and we had a big exhibition, six traveling, six traveling shows around Ontario. And my piece, I'm sorry, it's such a rotten show, piece to show you, but it was done with palm leaves from Easter time that we would have them in the church. And we also, it was the shape of a, a Muslim door and it was sort of relating to face a little bit. And it was sort of speaking to the world to open the door to all face. That was my theme really for my piece. Um, and it traveled all over the place. And I have it here, my staircase, if anyone would like to come and see it. Anyway, it was a very, it was a big piece I did. And that was a very important show because we were, we were sort of admitted to the big public galleries, which were a little bit poo-pooed, we felt, for, the, for crafts. The, below on that page, you'll see I had another exhibition in Bronte at the old post office gallery. And here I was having much more fun with baskets. And I made a, a basket for every month of the year. And I had different baskets. And I also wove a scarf for each month of the year. Um, I don't have any pictures of scarves, but the next page, you will see some of the baskets. And I can't actually, mm -hmm. I can't remember them all. The top one I know was strawberry picking and blueberry picking. And I know the bottom right was for, for um, green bean picking. And there were various different baskets. And I'm sorry, I don't have the names for them all, but I did do 12 baskets for each month. And that was fun. And I think um, it was very well received. And I think I was rather amazed because I sold them all. And, you know, it's interesting being a basket maker because most of my things are rather unconventional and different. Anyway, that was quite a, an interesting show. And the next way we go on, we go a little bit more off the wall here. I was, show, I was invited to take part in the show 
in a beaver house in Alberta. And I could send what I liked. I'd been teaching in Alberta. I did a lot of teaching for weaving, more weaving than basketry, actually. And they invited me and I, I made four masks. Mm. The mask on the left was the mask for the winter god. And that was made all of basketry. And the ones on the right, what, the, the lower one on the right, I think was summer. And it was coral grass using summer things. And the one above it was the harvest god. And I used straw and harvesty things. And I can't remember what I did for summer, but I obviously sold it because I didn't have it for my book. But each of the masks represented um, the time of the year. I, I called the sort of, they were just named, I suppose, for the seasons. And they were fun. They were quite big. The winter god was probably about two feet high. And again, I used mostly natural materials and I had a lot of fun making them. And they were shaped so they could actually be worn as a mask. I, I then moved on to, well, we're going to stop there. I think we're going to stop after the next one. Um, I then moved on to Burlington and Oakville's really close to Burlington. And they have a lovely cultural center there. And I did a, a certain period of time as a weaver in residence in Burlington. And they asked me to do a show. And I thought I had just recently been um, to Halifax. I think I went, I went to Nova Scotia and I saw a lot of fish wares and I saw interesting things like eel traps and lobster pots, mostly made as fiber objects made with different materials. So I thought for my show, I would call it fish traps. And I used, are we on the next page of the fish traps now? We should be. We've left yes. the god. We've gone to fish traps. We're on the uh, fish traps. Just a minute, Anchorage. I'm just going to um, ask people who are not muted. There's a couple of you who are popping into the screen every now and then to mute okay. yourselves. And um, and don't forget to have it on speaker view, the rest of you, so you can see a good big screen. Okay, Anchorage, we're going to break okay. after this one. Okay, carry on. Yeah, we'll break off the fish traps. The fish traps, they were big. And I think if you can see me in one of them, me in my 1980s clothes. Um, you can say with the big, big things. I had a lot of fun. I was very involved with white willow at the time. I grew my own white willow and I peeled it so I could use it as a white willow. And I dyed, quite, quite a lot of that was dyed right, round reed and dyed willow. Um, and you can see the little picture sort of in the middle has a whole lot of funny things on the wall, which weren't fish traps. They were called bed bug traps. And I'll show you a bit of traditional bed bug trap on the next page. But when I was in England at the University of Reading, they have a wonderful basketry collection. I also went there and <laughs> they had a funny little flat thing on the wall. And I said, what's that funny little flat thing? And they said, it's a bed bug trap. Which of course, I perked up my ears immediately. And the old days in England, when they were, they had all these, the co coaches would be traveling up and down through the country. And there would be inns and they would stop for the night and the horses would change and be watered and fed and bedded and they'd all move on the next day. But there was rather a terrible problem with bed bugs. And they discovered that bed bugs rather liked fresh willow. I don't, I don't know how fresh it had to be, but they liked willow. So every night when the guests left their, their hotel, the, um, the, the, the rooms, the maids would come into the rooms and they would have bed bug traps, these pieces of wicker behind the bolster at, at the head of, ahead of the bed. And I suppose all the bed bugs would migrate into the willow and they'd take them and shake them out of the window and put them back. And apparently it worked. And so this was, if somebody came with bed bugs, the bed bugs would go up the willow trap and get sent out of the window. And I thought this was rather fun. So instead of doing just one little flat bed bug, I thought it would be rather fun to do a series. So on this page in the middle, you'll see a whole series of sort of rectangular pieces, all done the same size, but I had to play with it a bit. So I did one in a very plain weave and they gradually disintegrated until they were in a very messy weave. And you'll see, you'll see a few more on the next page, but I wanted to point them out where we were on this page so you could see them all hanging up and you can see them in various shapes and sizes. But on the next page, we'll see them in different shapes because, because the, um, bed bug, the bed bug traps were fun, 
On the next page, you will see a sort of flat rectangular thing on top left. And that was a bed bug trap. That was a real one that I took at the museum. Well, on the right was my plain one. And you'll see how I, I went from plain to the lovely big messy one at the end. So I just took the shape and I made more and more of a fun sort of row of bed bug traps. So I wanted to just have a bit of fun with that. And then on the next door page, you'll see more sort of fish trappy things where I made a sort of lobster pot with a hole in the middle and traps, the eel traps where they went in. And you can see I just had quite a lot of fun with shapes, with long pieces of willow. And these were all big, they were huge. And um, they sort of filled up the gallery and it was a fun exhibition. Um, and I don't know if, <laughs> my great objective in all of this is to try and show people that basketry has such great capability of being used as sculptures, being as an artistic expression. And it's not just, I mean, it can be baskets and I admire the wonderful traditional baskets, but I was looking at it more from a different angle and seeing the potential of the material and using it and playing with it. And I think we'll stop here and see if there are any questions and you're probably getting tired of listening to me. And then we'll carry on and we'll look at a few more wilder things in a minute. Do we have any questions, Helen? I, there's nothing coming in on the chat. So if, if anybody would like to speak up, I think I'm gonna leave up the screen here. But if you uh, have a question about a slide, I can go backwards and find it. Um, so does anybody have a question about any of those particular projects that she had? That there's a question talking. in the chat. Is there? Okay, I might not even be able to see if I can see the chat. Oh, I'm going to have to leave full screen. Could you read it, Alexis? Because I, yes, uh, I, can. I can't see the chat. Yeah. This is from a question from Tony Dean. Some of the baskets have different colors. How were the canes dyed? Um, this one I used, well, I used to use um, uh, various different chemical dyes. Um, I can, you can also, any dye that would dye cotton or linen and they're bast fibers. Um, Rand reed is bast, a bast fiber too. So it's not like wool, you can't dye it like a protein fiber, but any bast fiber um, dyes will dye the, the reed. And um, it, it, was, it was actually not very difficult to dye. It was big and messy, but not very difficult. The colors were lovely and um, now there are a lot more chemical dyes. In those days, they weren't, I don't think they were terribly fast. I'm rather frightened that some of them might have faded, but I hope they, they faded gracefully. <laughs> I think that was the main thing, but it made such a difference and it was such more, so much more fun to use colored material. All right, Alexis, I figured out how to read the chats now so I can read the next one. How, from Susan Brown, how long did it take to make the baskets for that last exhibition with the fish traps and bed bug traps? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it was always fun. You know, having, having been sort of, sort of sort of design, I got very used to having a big sketchbook. And I used, when I was on my travels, particularly when I went out to the East Coast, I would make sketches of basket of, of fish traps and various things. And I came home and it, they just evolved, but probably at least two days for the big ones. But of course it would take time to die. It would take time to get the material. And um, on I went and, and it, it, I enjoyed it. I loved working with my hands and it was a big, lovely things to make. And it was fun. The bed bug traps were a little bit different, but even so, I think there's a tremendous potential in working with this sort of material. You know, the sky's the limit, really. Ankrit, I have a question, and mm -hmm. that is, um, you went back to college for three years, and you did all this time on basketry, and how old were your children at that time? In those well, my, I went back to college when my youngest was eight, and he started taking lunch to school, and I always said I would never be away when they all came home for lunch. And of course, in those days, children all came home for lunch. But when he went to grade five, he started taking his lunch. So from grade five up, you know, I had four of them. The youngest was in grade, grade five at that stage. I had a husband and dogs and all sorts of things. But, you know, having four children was wonderful. 
because we all we all worked and we helped and they helped me and I helped mm -hmm. them and I think it was a very I, I don't think anybody regretted that I became a student they all came along with me and saw things but it was it was a challenge I also taught a couple of classes at night to put myself through school I taught macrame crochet and knitting in the local schools and Pippa actually came and helped me teach because I had so many students but it was a sort of family thing really all right another question from the chat from Jean Dunning how necessary was it for you to have a college degree to allow or promote you to enter these exhibitions? Um, that's a good question, actually, because it, it is there's a certain sort of hierarchy in the world of art. And if they feel you haven't got any training, you're sort of not quite up to scratch. I think it's improved now, but it certainly helped having gone to the School of Design. And it helped me in many ways because I learned how to photograph and make slides of my work. I learned how to write invitations. I learned how to be a professional artist in addressing my, my shows and what to do. So I, I would never have done any of this if I hadn't gone to Sheridan. But I, I think in the world of whatever, like anything else, if you have a few n numbers after your name, it shows that you're more serious if you've just popped up out of the woods. I, it's, uh, the training certainly helped me. I would never have even thought about doing all this if I hadn't gone to Sheridan. But um, I was just very lucky. It happened to open just down the road. I could, I could get there easily. <laughs> and, and it was, you know, very fortunate for me. But I do, I certainly helped me. And it also, like anything else, I had a lot of people who were at Sheridan with me. And I had contacts, which I think perhaps was the main thing. Any more questions? I have a question, Helen. I don't know how to do the chat. It's Jenny Doyle here. Thank you. I just wondered where most of these baskets are now. <laughs> I'd like to know too. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I sold a lot of them. And in fact, oh. I did an amazing amount. Um, I, I don't know. I They sort of disappeared. I uh, Most of my big ones got bought. They were bought by people. And I was amazed that people bought things, but they did. And a few I have left, um, but they've gone out of my life. I'd rather like to have some of them back now, but, but they're somewhere. They're somewhere. They, got, they were bought or I'd have them home and people would come and see me and buy them from me. Wow. So they're out there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? So, so we've, got a, we've got a very exciting thing to come now. Should we continue on? All right, Anchor, before we do, could you turn your phone so that right now it's facing your, the side oh, yeah. of your head? There Sorry. we go. Yeah. That looks, that's better. Okay. Okay, I think there's well, one, just a minute, there's one more chat. Yeah, you maybe you could suggest you readjust your phone tip. My phone? Your phone yeah, see, see more to see more. I don't know. Your oh, your phone to see more. Okay, yeah. That, now we can see you better. Um, oh, good. Okay. And, I'm sort of um, I think that's what she meant. Uh, okay. okay, great. That was just I, being helpful. Okay, I'm going. I'm going to mute myself again, Ankrit, and and you carry on until you think you need another. If you just, okay. if you just, um, right now we can see the top of your head on your. Oh, there we go. When you look up a little, that's it. Okay. There we are. You can there push it are. back farther so we can see you when you're talking. It's very funny talking to all these people and not seeing them. Okay. We, we could have arranged that a little bit, but we will. We're good. You're good. Good. Keep going. So we're going on to the next page now where we had the figures. And this was a very exciting occasion in 1986 when the Hand, Weaver Guild, Hand Weavers Guild of America asked if we would like to have their big um, centennial, their, bi their biannual co convergence meeting in Toronto. And I think we had about 2,000 people. It was a huge event. And we took over the, um, the conference center. And we, we put everybody in the U of T residences and all over the place. And it was all very exciting. And I was one of the teachers. But we also had a fashion show called Fiber Magic. And this was to be on the opening night. And people were invited to come and we'd see the fashion show. And, of course, we had all these wonderful weavers from the States. 
But I decided I would make something with basketry. And I made these outfits using round reed and color. And I based them on the masters of the universe, which were a very popular um, sort of cartoon, comic book thing. And the masters of the universe were doing wonderful things in, in the 70s and 80s. So I made these costumes and I had the top right one, which were the two who were, they came on in the finale, they were the finale of the show in the dark. And when they arrived on the stage, they had twinkling lights on their heads or like helmets. And you can see the twinkling lights, there they were, these were the two models in the show. And the pictures below show um, the, when they weren't being modeled in the show, of course. And you can see, I, I just used round reed, I made shapes and they, would, they could be put on and off. And they had fasteners and fixers and things, but I called them twill and twiller. Twill is the sort of um, uh, weaving design. Twill goes sideways. And so I had twill and twiller and they were in the fashion show. And they were a lot of fun. I had them for ages actually. And um, that was quite exciting. I'd never been sort of at a big fashion show before. And I think it was rather a surprise because everybody else was doing beautiful hand weaving and very neat, tidy, lovely things. And then these funny things arrived on the stage. Anyway, that was the Hand Weavers of Guild, Hand Weavers Guild of America's big show. And after that, I, did, I went to a show in Riverdale Zoo in Toronto. The Riverdale Zoo is a, or was, I think it's been closed now, on the edge of the ravine. Um, uh, oh goodness. I can't remember what it was called. Anyway, it was very much east, it was east on the dot. It, it went down to the Don Valley, had a big property. It was and a Riverdale farm anchor at the Riverdale, Riverdale farm. farm. Yeah. I, I meant farm, <laughs> Riverdale farm. <laughs> and they had a big property and I was teaching people how to use natural materials because that is what I really love to do. And they asked me if I'd have, have a show in the farmhouse with things made from the materials that were all around the farm. So I did quite a lot of gathering and teaching and collecting and all the baskets that I showed there, I think I showed about 15 or 20, were all made and I taught people how to make them and we gathered them and we did them. I cheated a bit, I used rather longer pine needles than they had, a few things I cheated for a bit, but that was a show held in the farmhouse and it was fun. I met a lot of people, a lot of people came and um, I think I sort of showed people how you could gather and I was really getting into using natural materials and trying to encourage people to go out and collect and find stuff rather than go and buy. And um, the ravine was a lovely place. You went down, practically killed somebody once pulling a piece of grapevine out of a tall rotten tree, but luckily they were survived. Um, and, you know, it was just really an experience of gathering wild stuff and using it and having a show and showing how you could use these things, make baskets with um, you know, grass and pine needles and straw and all. And I don't I think I even had some rushes and cattails that I'd found on the property and dried them. So that was a, that was a fun, sort of more of an educational show. But I did feel that I explored, at least I introduced a lot of people to using natural materials, which is a little bit unusual and perhaps more so then to go out and gather rather than go and buy your whatever from the store and encourage people to do it at the right time and the season, how to gather, how to prepare, how to use and what to make with it. So that was my big sort of natural material exhibition. And the next one I did, which I think you will see on the next page, were birds in cages. And this was an exhibition at the Carnegie Gallery in Dundas. And that was quite fun. It was an invitational show. Anchor it, anchor it. Yep. I'm just gonna stop you there because I didn't go down to the pieces installed at the farmhouse gallery sorry. so I, I, I well, there were two pages for that and I didn't go down to the next oh, one but we just have close-ups now for a minute of your things from the farmhouse okay. gallery there's farmhouse baskets. Gallery. various ah. things coil basket pine needle baskets and there was a cedar basket there too and quite a lot of different you know, sorts and kinds I think I cheated a little bit I didn't think I really collected my cedar bark from them but they had cedars. And so I used all, it was a, it was a big a sort of expose of natural materials. 
Yeah. Well, okay. We've we've had a look now, and we I can go to the next slide. I just didn't. I just wasn't okay. aware of it. Make sure you tell me right, when to, right next. Okay. Now we're into birds and cages. <laughs> and these this was I I've always had rather a yen to make birds and things. And you know, basketry is such a wonderful material. You can make all sorts of funny shapes. It's very pliable. I think I'd actually probably been to Japan when I did this. And in Japan, they do, they have, ama I didn't see many, but they have amazing books on making all sorts of sculptural things. And I think I was inspired in Japan by a lot of things I saw there. And I came home and I really got into bird making and of course, making the cages and putting them in the cages. And there's dogwood there. I think I used bamboo, probably grapevine, probably willow to make the cages. They were quite big. They were probably two or three feet high. And the birds sitting in the middle. And they all hung around the gallery. And they were fun to do. And I rather wish I had kept one of them now. I see these things and I think it was rather fun to make them. But they've gone somewhere else now. Somebody's house. And now we're going to have a look at a, this is a bit of an adventure, this one. I was living in Oakville and we had a very huge gallery, great big black box, really. Very tall, very dark, not a window in the place. You went in through a sort of door and the offices were at the end. And it was just a great big square place. And they invited me to do a show and I was a little apprehensive because, you know, when you're a basket maker and you see something this size, you wonder how on earth you can deal with it. And so I decided I would really surprise everybody. And I would make, well, first of all, I had to have a theme. And my theme was called Interwoven Journey. And the journey on, on Earth was a journey that was on the floor level. And then we go up where we go and we have a journey up somewhere in the sky. And I had a sky journey and I had an Earth journey. And the Earth journey was the tunnel going in. And you went in, and I think you can see various pictures of me doing things down there. I made a tunnel. I, I built the tunnel out of willow, and I thatched it with straw. I think you can see a picture of me cutting the straw. But it was quite a long tunnel. But the idea of my, my earth journey was that one part you would go in and go around a corner, and it would be a, like a maze, and you would, get, you would get to the end, and it wasn't an end. You had to go back, like a maze which was sort of demonstrating the fact that sometimes we go wrong in our journeys and we have to go back and start again. So my journey for this was that we sort of took the right-hand one, you had to come back and start again. And then you took the left-hand one and you arrived in the gallery. And in the gallery, there was this great big, huge bridge. Now we can't see the bridge on that page. So I think we have to pop over to the next page, Helen. And I think you can see on the next page what the the suspension bridge looked like. But it wasn't a suspension bridge, really. It was based on a suspension bridge. But it was a huge, huge bridge um, in the gallery, it filled up probably over half the length. And I used coloured nylon ribbon. And I used I, I wove it with um, colored, was, it was the sort of nylon ribbon that you tie ships and things up with because I could dye it. It dyed beautifully. It was very easy to dye. And I had quite a lot of fun arranging it and making it. In fact, I had a lot of fun making it and doing it, making sure it would all be up in the sky because it was going to be lit and um, it was all suspended from up and up, up high. And it looked rather nice, actually. It was rather nice. And it was the idea was that it was the journey that we take after we leave this earth. So it was rather an ethereal feeling of, an, a, a, of a bridge up there. And then down underneath, I had a little tree. And it was where you could write your dreams or your hopes. I think I'd been in Japan at that time. And I loved the idea of um, sending messages out to the world. or wishes or whatever and so we did that and then at the top left you'll see I had fun we we were trained at the college to have interesting invitations for our exhibitions and I came up to Ottawa 
and I looked at the tra the original train ticket train tickets, and I based my invitation on the train ticket. You can see it at the top left, saying you were invited to come to the interwoven journey, and that was a it was a fun invitation, and I think you can see it. I can't really read it. Can you read it, Helen? Anyway, it, it, whatever it was, it was an invitation, us inviting people to come to the show. So it says and Oakville that, Centennial Gallery of Canada Interwoven Journey. Uh, the bearer is entitled to travel freely between inner space and outer space and to celebrate the opening on Thursday, blah, blah, blah. Yes. Yeah. Very that, was, that was the invitation that I had. And, and, it, and it was huge. It was a huge thing to do because it was such an enormous space to fill. And so it was really quite, quite educational for me. It was a big learning experience. And of course, getting the whole thing down to the gallery was enormous because we were living north of Oakville and we had to get it into a, a cube van <laughs> and take it down and unload it. And, you know, it was all quite difficult really, but it was, it was a great experience and it was a great fun thing to do. And I enjoyed doing it. Um, and I, I felt it was an expressive piece, you know, sort of showing how I felt about the world. And so I think we'll look at the next one and then we can have some more talk if we want to. And so the next one, this was quite an honor really. The Textile Museum in Toronto had an exhibition, I think it was for either four or five basket makers that they felt were the sort of main basketry people in, in the area. And there were quite a few of us. And they invited us to do baskets. We could choose baskets. And so the four big baskets were all baskets that I did for the for that exhibition. And um, I don't think we had a, a theme. I think we could do what we liked. But I think um, it was it was a very nice show. It was a very exciting show. And I hadn't done much showing in Toronto, so it was it was quite nice to be able to to be in Toronto and have things seen. And at the bottom of that page, you'll see a little piece. And this was a very exciting because the Oakville Centennial Gallery had had an exchange with a gallery in Japan in Osaka, and they'd put out a call for entry for pieces to go to Japan from Oakville or from wherever, Canada, I think, and there was going to be reciprocal. They sent us pieces, we sent them pieces. So I submitted this little piece you see here called the Oakville Moon, which was all natural materials. It's red dogwood and reed, and it's just held with a stick. And um, I was very excited. It went all the way to Japan, came back, and it's now in the Basketry Museum because, of course, it's all natural materials. So that was rather an exciting thing to have a piece go all the way over to Japan and back. And I was quite thrilled that it was chosen. And I still have it. I, I don't have many things, but I still have that. And that's in the gallery. So I think maybe we should stop and see if there are any more questions, because you're probably getting a bit tired of what I'm talking about. And then we'll do the last few shows. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to ask? All right, about... I've unmuted myself. Yeah, any <laughs> questions? You can type them in the chat, or you may just unmute yourself. And ask your questions. Anybody Hi, like it's, it's Dorothy Hobbs, and I'm interested in knowing how many people helped you set up that huge exhibition that you did about oh, in the, in the two worlds. About, about which? The two worlds. The oh, well, <laughs> I, the, the gallery staff helped me. And it was quite a thing. We had to get a cherry picker ring, so I had to go all the way up to the roof to tie it, you know, it, oh, it wasn't easy. <laughs> but you'll see later, there were more constructions up in the sky, but it was the beginning of sort of using space. And I, I planned it very carefully. I, I knew how it was going to be. I knew the size of the gallery. And it really, I wanted to put something up in the sky. And that was, that was my plan. But the most exciting thing about that was dyeing the nylon rope because it was beautiful, it was lovely and coloured, and it really showed up and sort of glistened in the light. It was quite exciting, it was very exciting. You are remarkable. <laughs> well, I had fun. And they, sorry, anchor it. Mm -hmm. I just want to say, yes, am I muted, Corey? Mm -hmm. I just want to say, anchor it, don't worry about 
not to, or making us feel like we don't want to listen anymore. Everything you say is absolutely <laughs> fascinating. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I, I feel it going on and on might be a bit boring for you. <laughs> not it's at not all. boring. No. Okay. Any more well, questions? I just any just, more questions? There's a, just one chat, maybe. Let's see. Oh, somebody just said amazing. Yes, it's pretty amazing. Um, no, Ankrit, I have a question about Japan. Uh, right. How long? How long were you in Japan when you went to visit, and what did you see there? Well, I. There was an international fiber conference in Osaka, and I applied and got a grant from the Ontario Craft Council to go and work with a basket maker there who had actually, I had actually met, she had been in, in Canada. And um, I went to Japan, I went to Osaka, I went to the international conference, and I had an amazing time. Mainly I went down to the uh, Beipu, the island at the bottom, to see the bamboo factory. Mm -hmm. And I saw everybody making bamboo things. Thing that I really noticed was they all had band-aids on their fingers. Because you know how sharp band bamboo is. But it was very interesting. And I, I really enjoyed my, my stay in Japan. But of course, you know, not being able to speak the language. I can still say Ohio Gazayamas, which is good morning. <laughs> That's about the only word I could say. But it was it was a great experience. And I did learn quite a lot about sculptural and using, I think I learned about using round reed to make things like bagels and silly things. It, it opened my doors to the potential of using those things to make shapes. And I think I got my bird inspirations there. I, I think travel is a tremendous thing if you're um, a sort of creative person because, you know, sharing uh, techniques and ideas and things it, it's what it's all about really it's amazing anyway right. Japan. I, yeah sorry yeah carry on no okay i just turned your phone again so that we can see you can see you see the, there we go we love you have a lovely face thank you and uh you want to carry on now go to the well next. now we'll carry on and we've got to um a page when this is rather a fun exhibition in fact there were two of them um, my, I had a very good friend called Melinda Mayhall, who was also a basket maker. She wasn't a natural material basket maker, but she made lots of baskets, did a lot of shows. She was much more of a production or basket maker. And she was very, very much more perfect than I was. I always felt I was rather untidy and messy, but she was very neat and beautiful. And we decided where well, we were invited to do a show. And we thought it would be great fun to make baskets representing people rather than just baskets. So in the end, we came up with two shows. We've had them both actually at that gallery. One was called Baskets from the A to M, to A to M. We made a basket for Anchorage. We made a basket for Melinda. She was the last one. And then we made baskets for names in between A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way to M for the first show. And I put some of those, some of these baskets here for you to see so that you can sort of see the first one on, can we go to the next page? Or are we on the page with the baskets? Yeah. Okay. Top left was anchor it because I had purple hair that time. That was I did that for me. I was purple hair. And then I think the next one was Coco the Clown. And it was all sorts of um, I think it was funny, bits of um balloons I found at a, at a, um, a fairground somewhere. It was made out of lots of bits of balloon. ABC. Oh, Dolly Parton was the next one with the bulges. <laughs> and then we had Elvis Presley, which was those ghastly pink beads and things. That was Elvis, because it was very much at Elvis time. And then D, ABC D. I don't know what no, we had Dolly Parton. E. F. F was Frankenstein. He's in the middle with a funny big, big hat on top. F. And then we had um oh, 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 oh goodness, what's his name? Oh, the man who came from England pretended to be Ray the, Owl. Ray, Ray, Owl. Ray Owl. And everybody Ray. else, please remember to mute yourselves. Remember to mute yourselves. That, that was Gray Owl. And he's made of all the things that Gray Owl would have loved in the bushes. And then I had the ink spots at the end, the little black ones. And then I think down here we've got um, Jack and Jill. Oh, no, it couldn't be Jack. Yes, Jack and Jill. 
David, Jack and Jill are two little baskets on the left, bottom left. And the next one was Houdini, which was really a big grapevine basket all sort of twiddled around. And then we had Mary has a little lamb, it's a little lamb. And then we had Melinda, and Melinda was my friend who was the other half of the exhibition. And she had little baskets all the way around. And of course, she did one, she, she was from the States, so all her figures were sort of different to mine. But it was quite fun to see who she, she'd chosen as her name people. So that was the A to M part. And we are in, in the, a little bit further along, we're going to see the M to A again. But it was sort of fun to choose baskets to represent a person or a name, you know. And I think I always in my work, I've done something that has a meaning or it, it resolves something or it expresses something. Because I, I think, you know, to, to work in that way makes it a lot more interesting than just churning out things that are things. Anyway, that was a fun exhibition. And I think we sold most of them. I don't have any of them left. I don't know where they, they all went to if I didn't have them. But if we go on to the next page, it, this was sort of interesting. This was the ghost in the machine. And I don't know if anybody knows about this, but when the industrial age came, people started to rather look down on um, fabrics and materials that were made in the industry because they were all so perfect. And people wanted to see a little mistake or a little broken thread or a little error to prove that it was actually handmade. It wasn't made in this perfection. So they would put a ghost in the machine and every now and again, it would make a mistake. It would do a double skip or break a thread or something. And so they wanted to have a, an exhibition. And this was in Halifax called A Ghost in the Machine. And so they asked me if I would submit some things for The Ghost in the Machine. And it was rather hard to think about what I would do. Anyway, I, I chose four in the end. And I did the Hydro Ghost, which I think was the left one. It was made of all sorts of wire, and very odd sort of cables and things. That was my ghost. I can't remember what the second one was. Did you have it there, Helen? I can't read it. What was the Helen, the second ghost? It's the ghost of Ma's Bell. Oh, Ma Bell. Ma's <laughs> Bell. You have it, my apostrophe, but just kind oh, of cute. Yeah, well, yes. that, that was the ghost of Ma Bell. That's right. That was the telephone with the directory and all the bits and pieces went into the bell. But that wasn't the second one. Anyway, that was the third one. And, I, and the end one, I think, was the ghost... There was, was the, a, there was a ghost of the dreaded virus, which we don't yes. have a picture of. We'd all love to see that now. <laughs> well, the you have to make a new one. Why don't you make a new one for COVID? A ghost of <laughs> no, no, the dreaded virus in those days. We're back in the eighties, and we all got viruses in our computers. I don't know if you remember back then, but we got a virus, and you had to buy something, and it would clean the virus out of your computer. And that was a very 1980s sort of thing that the virus would come and remove all your stuff or do something terrible in the machine. And that was why I called it the ghost, the, the dreaded virus. Anyway, those were sort of funny things really. And they all went off to Halifax together. And I think we're going to move on now to the next one, which was actually a very exciting show because this was one of the big things that I did. Um, in Owen Sound, they were having a very special exhibition showing people walking in their environment. Owen Sound is on the top, on a part of the Bruce Trail, and they were trying to um, promote hiking and walking in the area. And they had this show in the art gallery in Owen Sound, and it was um, to encourage people, you know, to to reflect on the beauty of, of walking and hiking in, in the surrounding area. And I was asked if I would do something. And I was had rather a lot of thinking to do. I couldn't think how I'd have people walking in the woods and what I'd have do, them doing. And in the end, I came up with an idea of having them walking across the top of the road. Um, I decided I would have armatures, which would be tied up with again, you might, using my friendly nylon rope, and I would suspend them on armatures, which would have loops at the top 
and loops on the bottom of both feet. So I could tie the head on one string and then I'd have two strings coming along, one for each leg at the bottom. And I would make my armatures into people. Well, they wanted me to have um, people working with me. And I had five of the local residents came and helped me because I had to get them made. The, we worked in the market, the, the market building in Owen Sound, and they, they we'd only have it from Monday till Friday lunchtime. So we only had four and a half, hour, four and a half days to make them. And I think we had, I don't know, eight or nine figures and a dog. So I did all the work ahead of time. I knew what I wanted and I planned what I was going to have. And I didn't know any of these four people, five people I think came. And so we all arrived on Monday morning. I think we arrived on Sunday night actually. And um, they had to help me because I didn't, couldn't possibly do all this by myself. And we got out the grapevine and I think the first day we made the heads and did a few things. Anyway, as time went on, we developed them, we made them. And I think if you can see me there sort of in the middle walking with one of the figures, you can see they weren't small, they were quite big. And they were quite big to carry. So at the top left shows all the people helping me. And you can see the them strung across the top of the road. And you can see them getting ready. And you can see a bit of a close up. And I, I thought it was fun. We had a dog, but they were basically walking across the road. They had to be at least 14 feet up because that's the, for you have to have 14 feet to clear buses and trucks and things. So they were pretty high and we used the lamppost on one side. And I think we it put a pillar in for me for the other side. I was very lucky I had a help with sort of construction because it wasn't easy to get them up and put them. We had to sort of break, we had to get them all up and pull them up on a pulley and get them in the right place. And I had to sit on top of a, um, a cherry picker to make sure they were all in the right place so they could go across the road. It was, it was actually quite exciting, quite frightening really. But you know, I had to be brave because they were mine. And we put them all up and they lasted the whole summer. It was quite exciting. People would phone me and say, oh, I went and saw, I saw your, your figures walking across the road. And they lasted, they came back. And actually I had quite a few of them at the farm for a while because I, was, I did that just before I came to the farm. And um, they were just an expression. Again, I love the idea of being able to use basketry techniques and make the heads. They were like grapevine bowls for the heads, you know, and I could use a lot of willow, a lot of grapevine, a lot of, it was all natural materials. And of course I had the armature for it. Well, I had big armatures and little armatures. And I think the dog had a little one too. And I had the armatures made ahead of time. And of course they all had to have a little, they had to have the little circles so they would stick on to the, um, the, the, the things that held them up. Anyway, it was all quite exciting. It was very exciting actually. And I was terrified they were all going to fall down or the wind would blow them over or they'd collapse, but they did last. They lasted the whole summer and they walked across and I was very grateful to my people who helped me. And I think we had a good time. It was quite an adventure. So that was a big show and it was a big effort and I had to get them all ready ahead of time because of course I wasn't living at home, I was living up there. So that was a big adventure and then I came back and I had another little bit of an adventure because I was asked to teach at Arendale College. They have an art gallery there and they invited me to have a one-man show and again it was a sort of big box room with nothing very exciting to work with. Um, so I had a big think about this and I, in the end I decided I would make gateways and each gateway would represent a stage in, in our life and I would use natural materials, it would all be natural materials and each gateway would mean um, transition from being a baby to a child to a you know, teenager to an adolescent and so on up and so I've got photographs, I've got pictures here. And if you look at the top left, you'll see the one on the right hand side of the top left was, was the childhood one. And I felt that children were very sheltered. They were cuddled inside that gateway and they were just starting to emerge as little people, but they were in a very sheltered, safe, cozy little environment. And that was the first gateway. And then the second gateway, 
was a little bit bigger. You can see it next to the next, the next right one, sort of more triangular. And it's getting a little bit um, a little bit rough at the edges here because they're becoming teenagers and they were starting to have minds of their own and think and look out into the world. But they were still in a shelter. They were still um, nestled in their homes, but they were still starting to feel their their you know their oats and go out and do things and meet the world and the one on the top right is really um a sort of big teenagers and big big no actually that's beyond teenagers that's the young adult when they're rather strong and big and going off and doing their thing and being um being grown up and being big so that was a much sort of much wider arch they weren't really in an arch and they were being very tough and big but then if we go down to the bottom left hand corner that's when they become a parent and they suddenly change instead of being rushing around the world and being big and important they they, they become parents and so they again become more inward and it's a sort of softer gentler life when you're looking in and caring for babies and you were looking after other people so it was a more of a nestled gateway and then of course you get the next gateway which is middle age and i use phragmites for these and phragmites i felt some people in middle age get bigger and stronger and grander and they are really coming into they are sort of progressing and, and becoming people in the world you know prime ministers and getting important and sometimes you some people fail at that stage and it's not an easy time for people they suddenly have problems they have health problems they have difficulties and they fall by the wayside and so my phragmites some of them are sticking up big and strong and some of them are getting a little bit more fragile and a little bit more sort of feeble and then the last gateway was made of golden willow which I had lovely golden willow going down at the bottom of the field. And it's all creaky and bendy. And it's sort of a bit fragile and old, a bit like me. <laughs> and it was sort of a gateway look showing that in old age, you know, you're still there, you're still a gateway, but you're getting a bit frail and you're still, and still, still there, but you're not quite as big and strong as you used to be, but you're still busily doing your thing. And then the very last gateway was our journey on, on beyond this life. And I made that when I was in Bangladesh. I was there working for Cuso, and they, I got lovely silk in the market. And I made that, and I hung that in the sky. And I thought that was the last gateway. And so that was the end. So we went from the sort of cradled babyhood all the way up to the lovely colour in the sky. And that was our progression. And I called it footstep. Um, and I, I, I sort of... I rather liked doing that. I felt I could use the natural material as an expression. And, and, you know, using bits of willow and stick and things, they're not precious, but they can be very expressive. And you can use them for all sorts of things. And really, environmentally, they're very friendly. You're not damaging anything. You're not using anything. You're just using what nature has. And that's really why I love to use wild material. And I, I, always feel it always regenerates you're not taking something away that shouldn't be taken so that was my footsteps and that was one of my quite big shows too it was quite a lot of work but i enjoyed it and then we see the other the m to a the rest of my my baskets when i showed you the first half they were people these were the, this was the m to a the end of the alphabet when we did it again and we had a few more baskets here and this was some of the ones i did at the end i think n was night florence nightingale i think q was the queen queen of england and then i think we had are we on the next page helen sorry have yes, we got the next yes we're on it we are on it yes and then we've got, we've got down to snow white at the bottom left and then we've got us the magic dragon and then the other one's got WYSIWYG, which was the computer thing. So those were those were the I haven't got them all here. Those were the the fine the end of the alphabet. We did it one year, and then I think we had a gap, and then we finished off. And that was that was a fun exhibition. It was nice working, Melinda, and she was a really good friend of mine. 
and she was an amazing basket maker. So I really, really enjoyed it. And I think we're nearly at the end now. And the last, very last exhibition, if we go over now, Helen, was over, up and away, I think I called it. Um, in Oakville, we had the most enormous shopping mall built. On it was the north called, side. Yeah, I agree. It was reaching up, out and across. Oh, that's <laughs> I, that was nearly right. I knew it was something like that. Reaching up, out and across. Actually, that, that meant quite a few things, actually. But that was the title. And I was invited to do these figures. Um, the two-story shopping, Oak, the, it wasn't called the Oak Queen Mall. It was called the Oakville Place. It's very grand. Two stories, enormous stores, just colossal great place. And of course, when you have two stories, you have a lot of space between one side and the other. You know, there's a lot of air with nothing in it. And I was asked if I would like to do some figures. And um, again, I was asked if I would like to work with people. And the Oakville Gallery were the people who asked me to do it and you to have my piece in the gallery. Anyway, I had recently been to Cirque du Soleil and I loved the Cirque du Soleil. And I thought what fun it would be to have trapeze artists um, doing their thing in this big open space. It was a colossal space. And of course it was very high. So I again decided I would have these flying trapeze people. And I, I had the two of them touching and I you know how they swing and they catch and they, they catch each other and they do the most amazing things. And then I had um, two figures touching. And then I had one figure and they were sort of in the various parts between the galleries, between in the space between the two sides. And um, again, I had people came up. We invited the public to come and help me. Sometimes it's a bit of a nuisance actually, because you know you couldn't get on because they all wanted to come and do things, but we did it. We managed it. And we had a huge pile of grapevines stuck outside the mall. They got very worried with all the leaves that we kept bringing in and out. I love trouble with <laughs> the workmen who kept saying, you keep making a mess. I said, well, of course we do. We're using natural materials. Anyway, we got them done. Um, I think we started on a Monday and we finished on a Friday. And Friday night, the, um, the man came in with a cherry picker again, this great thing. And we had a lot of trouble hanging them up. It was very, very difficult because, you know, it was such a huge high place to do it. And again, I was stuck up at the top of this thing, trying to tie them up and get them in the right place. Particularly the two figures had to be in the right place. So they were touching. Anyway, we did it. And um, the next morning I went up and one of them had fallen down. It's absolutely terrible. I was so worried because I thought, imagine if that fell down and the place was full of people. You know, I'd be sued for millions of dollars. Anyway, I don't know why it fell down, but either one of us didn't tighten it up very tightly or some bad fairy went and cut it down. But we got them up, we put them up and they hung in the, uh, the Oakville place for, for weeks. And that was actually quite fun to do. I was already living up here by then. And I went down with all the stuff and I had the armatures made in Perth and um, we took them down and put them up and they all hung happily in the gallery for, I don't know, a few months. And that was, that was fun. And it, you know, it's interesting working with people because you always hope that you'll encourage them to explore the world of basketry and do an experiment. And I think some of them did. Some of the people were people I knew from Sheridan, of course, and that was very nice. Anyway, we had a good time. We enjoyed it. So that was really my last big show. And on the next page, we have the shows the, the my last show really that I did was at the schoolhouse. And here again, I was working with bir my, my birds. I, I shared a show with Gloria and you can see Gloria's pictures in there. Lovely pictures that she did. And I did the birds and she did the pictures. And you can see I have my sheep. I had a flock of sheep there and a few birds and a few odds and ends and little things. And those were again, all made with willow, all made with natural materials, mostly willow, mostly grapevine, mostly perhaps grasses or smaller things that I went and found. 
and use. Um, uh, quite a lot, actually. I think I used quite a lot of Russian cattails in that one, those ones too. But most of them have gone too. And then on the very last page, one you probably very likely will remember, was the Minotaur that we made for our, our Celtic festival. Our first festival we had was um, Celtic and we celebrated the Minotaur and all the excitement. And I made a Minotaur and I decided it would be fun to make a great big creature and have him as a sculpture in front of the schoolhouse. And so I, got an, I made an armature, I got an armature made and you can see on this, on this page, this great big creature. I mean, it was quite big, it was quite a lot bigger than me. And we had him up in front of the schoolhouse and he survived for one whole summer. We put him in the shed for the winter and the next year we took him out. And it, that weekend we were teaching a workshop on making coracles because we were going to have a coracle regatta. And I remember I was up there, I think Jill Kirsch came to teach it. And we were very busy making our coracles when that wasn't Jewel, it was somebody else. Anyway, whoever it was, um, the photographer came up from the Frontenac News and said, I've come to take a picture of the Minotaur. And I said, oh, good, come up and see him. I looked up. I said, oh, he's up there. Oh, he's not up there. And I realized to my horror that there were, far, there were tire tracks going all the way up to where he was and he'd been stolen. And apparently there had been a lot of high school shenanigans going on the night before and they'd come and stolen him. I never got him back and we never got the armature back and I always hoped that somebody would bring the armature back because we could make another one. You know, I, I think from the grapevine he went on a bonfire, had a fiery end. I wondered if they'd thrown him in the river but we looked over the river, we couldn't see him but I think he had a fiery end and I never got him back. At one time we put an advertisement offering a hundred dollars if anybody would tell us where the armature was because I felt we could make another one but we never heard and so he lives and he exists now as a photograph but he was quite magnificent and we, we it was a it was a a big um a, a job to make him we, we all worked together and it wasn't just me it was a lot of us we all made him so it was a very much a joint mirror basketry event and we used the willow that we had on the aberrants so you know it all worked out beautifully really and he was very magnificent but I was sorry he had a fiery end I was very sad he had a fiery end and then if we and I think we've got to the end really now and then there's a picture of a, a little cat on the last page something I must have made for fun um, but I think I'd like to sort of end and say that really the world of basketry has been an, an amazing adventure for me and it has such tremendous potential and I think one of the great things about basketry is that we don't need to shop, we don't need to buy, we can use what we've got and one of the one of my beliefs and one of the reasons I have my gallery is that I want to encourage people to revert to using what we have in the environment and most of these things are renewable rushes grow every year cattails grow every year willow grows every year grapevine grows every year all these things grow and we go and cut them and use them and they come back and so you know from the point of view of the environment they're wonderful tools they can you can use them for all sorts of exciting things or functional things and i i respect traditional craftspeople it's not that I don't respect them. It's that I think I was trained to not make the same thing over and over again. And I think that's why I've always moved into a different phase. And I suppose I always will. But anyway, that's that was my world of exhibiting. And I felt very fortunate that I've had this experience. And I really go back to my dear Samoyed puppy dog, because if I hadn't had a puppy dog, and got interested in weaving and spinning and gone to Sheridan, I don't know what I'd have done, but I would never have done all that I have. So that's the story of the adventures of art world. And I hope you've enjoyed it. And do please ask me any other questions. That was great, Ankrit. I'm going to stop the share now, I think. And then um, your camera has gone off completely, but we can tell, right, I don't know if you, you won't be able to see us. Oh, 
Go to Professor gallery Carmen. view now, people, and, get, and go to gallery view. We just have your iPhone with a... With oh, well, maybe I should go and plug myself in, because I wasn't planning to use my phone. I was planning to use my iPad, so I'm going to walk into the kitchen and plug it in, just in case it's dying. Well, well, yeah, okay. And can you still hear us? I can hear you, yes. Okay, because there's quite a lot of comments and questions. Oh, good. Well, I'll, I'll just walk myself into the kitchen. All and right. I'll plug it just in case. Well, I hadn't planned to use my iPhone, but luckily I have it, and I used it, so I'll just plug us in just in case. Okay. Um, okay, there's various nice comments, and there's some of them are questions and some of them aren't. Um, first one, I think, um, Dean had to go. <laughs> Wonderful. Next one. Wonder. The, this is from Heather. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful art, anchor it. Inspiring. Were you teaching in Bangladesh, and how did that experience impact your own artistic expression? Well, I was teaching in Bangladesh, but it was very difficult because the materials, the only materials I had there were palm leaves, and the only way I could really change what they did with them was to use to dye them and teach them how to use pattern. And of course, dyeing anything in Bangladesh was pretty hard because for one thing, they didn't have much water. They didn't have much, I had to use a funny little stove. But I did, in, I did teach, I had somebody called Josephine who came and learnt with me. And I had ver ver various Muslim women who came and talked, talked with, learnt with me. And it was, it was fun. Um, I, I had a, my main trouble in Bangladesh was to try and make them something that was a traditional Bangladeshi item because they wanted to sell it you know with UNESCO and they, I wanted them something that would be of their, nat their their own nature and I couldn't the only thing I could find that was particularly Bangladeshi were their decorated buses which were wonderful they had bus their buses were painted with amazing things but there was no I couldn't find much traditional Bangladesh material anyway I did I I, I enjoyed it a lot um, I always wondered in the end how much help I really had been, but um, you know, you just hope you um, you hope you you've made a difference to them. And my goodness, they made a difference to me. I learned about rice paddies and little houses and things, and that was a great experience. I wanted to get to the outside world and see it as as, as a helper rather than a tourist, and it was wonderful. Hey, Catherine. Um comment here just wonderful exhibits you certainly turned us all on to basketry at Mira I first met you at Halliburton where you were teaching there thank you so much anchor it oh that's nice thank and you, Claudia Kat. Claudia Claudia Radmore what an amazing amount of art pieces that are simply wonderful thank you for showing these well, thank you thank you Donna um she gave me a direct message, but I think it's shareable. What are the armatures made from? The armatures, mostly um, they were things that you use in um, making steel. I'm trying to think what you call them. Rebar? Was it rebar? Rebar. rebar. Mostly, okay. She asked yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, mostly rebar. And I could paint the rebar if I needed to. Um, and, so I, and it wasn't particularly heavy. So I would use rebar and then we would have to attach these things on the end to hold the ropes up you know attach them on the end and you could I made I made figures rather like an upside down Y and the Y were the legs at the bottom and then the, I could make the arms with the basketry material and I would just have the, the upright and the upside down Y would be the armature. Great okay from Sulin Cedar lovely to watch and listen to you anchor it's such a pleasure to hear all the stories related to such a fabulous body of whoops, body of work. Thank you from uh, La, um, <laughs> I can't pronounce, La Chwiltek, La Chwiltek land, Quadra oh, Island, BC. Oh, nice. oh, nice. How nice. Thanks so much. Sorry, so Lundin, do you want to speak to that? I was going to say, lovely place with cedar. I yeah. Would think. Cedar, Cedar. Cedar used to live around here and now she lives out there. Yes. Okay. Yes. Alexis asks, when is your next exhibition? <laughs> well, actually, funny you say that because there was a call for entry out west for 
um, art connected to our, our planet and our problems. And I've been thinking about that, but I've perhaps suggested to the Lanark people who are involved in, um, you know, our, 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 what, what am I trying to say? That I, I was suggesting they might have an art show um, and use the um, using climate, local climate, climate network planner. Climate yeah. network planner can then have it on a, on a climate crisis and so on. Uh, I suggested they might have a traveling show which would travel around and it would be would it would make people think. Anyway, I don't know. It's just some, it's just the latest idea of mine, <laughs> but it would be uh -huh. fun. And I think that we should use art to express ourselves. Hmm. Okay, another Sulin, another comment. Your ongoing teachings continue to inspire us. I think we can all agree with that. That was nice. Thank you. Thank you. How sweet of you. Catherine, <laughs> also all the basketry network issues you put out. Basketry network issues? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I, I have a, a basketry, my basketry museum, I started here and I I have a um, Alana Kylan's basketry website and every two weeks I do a blog and talk about basketry. And if anybody's interested just look up Lana Kylan's basketry museum and sign up for the for the newsletter it's called threads and every two weeks you get a little note telling you what to do with baskets. <laughs> Quite fun really. Now, Kathy, Kathy Bolsma to everyone. I'm so, so inspired to hear you speak. About 10 years ago, I was lucky enough to be with you to make a basket. Oh, how nice. A basket. Let's see what, sorry, I am. Okay, yeah. To make a basket. Okay, I'm, I'm losing. Uh, there it is, a basket. It is part of my art studio now. I am hoping to learn more about the natural materials of this area and ways of helping the children and myself to see the possibilities and affordances of the materials in our environment. Oh, I nice. hope to see you at Blueberry Creek Forest School in the spring. Good. Yes. Yes. I hope. I hope. I, I hope we'll get together there. That would be really nice. Yeah, Kathy's one of our speakers next week, talking about yes. children yes. and uh, nature yes. and so on. Well, I mean, this is such an ideal subject, and really, I think if you get to you, if you learn to use the natural materials, you have so much more respect for everything that grows. Mm. And that's what we should be doing. I really think it's part of, you know, particularly where we live here, which is so lucky. We've got so much, so much growing. You don't have to go very far to make a basket. <laughs> Liz, Liz Richmond, to, Liz Richmond, lovely to know more about your work and how timely is the message of using natural materials. Thank you, Anchor. Oh, thank you. Uh, I keep flowing through here. Michael Peterson, whenever I do a talk or workshop or attend a craft show or studio tour, someone comes up to me and asks me if I know the woman with the unusual name and they try to recall that name. I suggest <laughs> anchor it Dean and they say <laughs> yes. <laughs> a testament to your impact on craft and art. Thank you for being my inspiration to become a basket maker. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, Michael. Thank you, Michael. How kind of you. My, Mary Jane Watt, it was lovely and inspiring to see your expressions anchored. Thank you. Hillary, yes. so interesting. I had no idea of the full breadth of your work. Thank you. Somebody else said uh, earlier, she thought, I thought I knew this woman. <laughs> <laughs> same, with, same with me when I saw the show, you know, uh, yesterday or whatever. Yeah. yeah uh, tell people about the videos oh, uh, on, on her website. Okay, we're supposed to tell... Uh, you have videos on your website. I have videos on collecting, yes, and and quite a few videos. Since COVID started, I keep my basketry museum alive by making videos because that's that's one way of reaching reaching out. And is your website is called what? Lanark Highlands Basketry Museum, and it's the only basketry museum in Canada. <laughs> I, think, I think there's one somewhere in Egypt or somewhere. Anyway, if you look at the internet, you can find there are a couple somewhere else, but I think we, we are the only basketry museum in Canada, but it's Lanark Highlands Basketry Museum. If you look at Basketry Museum, we sometimes get it. I'm told, I haven't done it myself. 
<laughs> Those videos, I believe, were made by Tom Shoebridge, who is rather were, something, yes. of a, something of a professional in that field. So thank, thank you, Tom. Thank you. Yes, yes. He, he, he came and photographed me doing it. All right. So that, that's, that's the end of the chats, and we are pretty much out of time. If anyone else has an urgent con, uh, comment or something lovely you really want to say, please do, and then we'll wind it up pretty soon. I, I need to say thank you, Helen, to you very much for all your help. And 